Der er et par ledige pladser faktisk, som man godt kan sidde på. It is now 4.30 and we are ready to start this book launch. Welcome everybody, my name is Martin Oerup, I'm um, CEO here at CPOS. Um, and we are here for a book launch event for the Danish translation of the myth of the rational voter. We have the author, Brian Kaplan, with us online. Um, the Danish translation looks like this. Have you seen this? How, how do you how do you see this like that, right? Have you seen this, Brian? Uh, I still the, can barely see it. That, that, okay, <laughs> that's the Danish version. <laughs> I need to get it closer to the camera. <laughs> okay, well, congratulations. Do you have the book out in Danish now? Congratulations to uh, all of us for having it in Danish. Uh, what's going to happen now is Brian will speak for about 20 minutes uh, about the book, um, and then we'll have a 10-minute uh, question and answer session. Yes, and we still have people pouring in the, the myth of the punctual. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's great. It's great. It's lovely. Come in, sit down. It's great to have you here. Um, so what's going to happen is that Brian will speak. We can't. We can't. I can go 20 if you want. I'm a professor. I can talk for any amount of time. I know that, Brian. That's why we gave you 20 minutes. <laughs> so what's going to happen is Brian is going to talk for about 20 minutes, then we'll have a 10-minute uh, 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 session for, for questions, and then we'll switch, Brian will leave us, and then we'll switch into Danish and uh, look at this whole uh, aspect of the not-so-rational voter from a Danish perspective with an election campaign coming up, uh, apparently. Um, we're not in an election campaign, just like Russia is not in a war. Right? Um, okay, so here we go. Brian, congratulations with uh, your book, finally uh, having been translated into Danish. Thank you for joining us. Um, what can I say? The floor is yours. The, uh, the, the, the cyberspace is yours. Take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Martin and CPOS. I got to visit you guys a few years ago before COVID, and I was able to see all of the love in the room. Uh, it is mutual. I am a bit surprised that the book was translated into, into Danish because your English is so great over there. But no doubt there must be some people that will now be able to finally read it that we're not going to read it in English. Or maybe it's just better in Danish. I don't know. You'll have to tell me. Uh, just to give you some background on the book. There is a long tradition in social science and economics of saying we have to understand politics as if everyone involved is rational, not just politicians and interest groups, but regular voters. We've got to think about it that way. This means that if you take it very literally, that you are not allowed to make any arguments like protectionism exists because people underestimate the social benefits of free trade. Rather, built into the definition of rationality is that on average, people must be correct. Some people might overestimate the effects of uh, the benefits of protectionism. Some might underestimate the benefits of protectionism. But you are not allowed to argue as a matter of methodology that things are going wrong in politics because people just have, on average, incorrect beliefs. When I started working on this, I was always skeptical of this idea. But I did figure that there would be some good evidence in favor of the normal view and that I would need to argue with that evidence. What I actually found when I started reading was that this was really just pure dogma. It was something that theorists said because it made their lives easier, which actually, if you know economic theory, we often do this. Economists, when they do economic theory, will often just assume that the math works out in an easy way so that they can get an answer and get publications. You can understand why they pull this trick, but it's not a good way to think about the world. 
Rather, it's much more important for assumptions to be realistic, to look at how things really work. Anyway, so when I started going to the evidence, I just found that essentially all of the empirical evidence said that regular people do make large systematic errors. It isn't just that people are ignorant where they randomly are too high or too low. Rather, there are clear cut patterns in the data. The main ones that I talk about in this book are, first of all, uh, anti-market bias. Uh, laymen tend to systematically underestimate social benefits of markets. They assume falsely that because people in markets are making money, therefore the social outcome will be bad. They're judging things based upon intentions rather than understanding the logic of the consequences. They're forgetting this basic lesson, or maybe forgetting is charitable. They never understood this basic lesson of economics, which is that in well-functioning markets, the way you make money is by making customers happy. Right? You can see this very easily with online sales. If you are running an online business, you want your customer satisfaction ratings to be very high because that is what you need to do well in business in the long run. Right? So anti-market bias is one that I talk about a lot. Another one is anti-foreign bias, being especially pessimistic about the social or about the economic effects of economic interaction with foreigners. All right, economists traditionally have taught about free trade. I have focused a lot more on the far more regulated area of immigration. I know that in Denmark, immigration is a big issue and even out of people who are pro-market, there's a lot of skepticism about immigration. Uh, it would be great if we could come back to that later. Right. Uh, but in any case, you know, the logic of free trade in labor is the same as the logic of free trade in goods. In both cases, you increase total human wealth by specialization and trade. The argument that if we have free trade in goods, we don't need free trade in labor is totally wrong because in modern economies, 80% of the economy is services. 80% is services. Therefore, if you can only trade goods, you can only trade about a fifth of what people actually want to trade. You cannot make restaurant meals for me from Denmark if I'm living in America. You can't mow my lawn for me. You can't take care of my kids. You can't, cannot take care of the elderly and so on. Uh, so free trade without free migration is really barely free trade at all. Uh, then in the book, I also talk about make work bias focusing on employment rather than production when you're judging economic performance. Denmark is one of the better European countries for labor market regulation, but you were not always. Uh, so we can go and look at, other, at the re regulations in France or Italy, for example, and see so much of it is based, uh, of the policy is based upon the idea that the important part of the economy is the job. When, of course, in reality, it has to be the production. If you have an economy where everyone has a secure job, but nothing gets produced, then you are desperately poor, or actually you're dead because <laughs> nothing's produced, then you don't have anything. All right. Uh, so that is an, another ma major economic bias in the way that laymen tend to see the world. The last one I talk about is a generic pessimism. Just thinking the world is in decline, is bad now, and is going to get worse. Uh, since we're out of COVID, this is once again true, basically. During COVID, I had to say, well, yeah, we got things are gotten a lot worse. Uh, it's not always true that things are getting better, just normally. Uh, in any case, now things have obviously improved a lot. Uh, of course, it's easy to improve when you start out in a terrible situation, as we did with COVID when so many countries were just locked down. I don't remember quite how bad Denmark was. I know you were much worse than Sweden on this, uh, but uh, we can come back to that as well. All right. Now, uh, there's an old joke that says an economist is someone who sees that something is possible in theory and what, or sees that something is true, rather, excuse me. There's an old joke that says, says an economist is someone who sees that something is true in practice and wonders how is it possible in theory? All right, now, in a way, this makes economists seem like a very silly, but this is not such a bad approach when looking about the world. If you're a physicist and you see a helium balloon, you shouldn't go and say, oh my God, I guess gravity's not true. 
right? You've got, you've got a theory and the first step is to say, well, can we understand how there can be a floating helium balloon, but also gravity? Right? I'm not a physicist, but I think they do understand that one pretty well. <laughs> Something to do with density of helium, I guess. All right, and the same thing I say goes for economics, where at least the first thing we want to do is look at the facts and see, well, is it really true that theory disallows this, or is that just our poor understanding of the theory? All right, now, how could it be that voters are so irrational, right? Because the errors that I'm talking about, they're not just errors of one or 2%. They're massive. They're often night and day errors. For example, on understanding why the price of gasoline rises, you'll have about 90% of economists saying supply and demand, about 25% of non-economists saying supply and demand. What do non-economists think then? Cartels, conspiracy, that's why prices go up. Why do prices go down? They never go down, <laughs> all right? <laughs> all right, <laughs> kind of the Lay, layman's view of things. You know, they only complain when they're going up. They don't celebrate when things are going down. So there's no need for a theory of when prices are going down. All right. So anyway, how is it possible that layman could be so wrong about this stuff? Well, I mean, one story could be that all of economics is wrong and people aren't rational anywhere, right? So people go to the store and just buy a bunch of stuff they don't want without looking at prices and then get home and say, why, why, how did this happen to me? Uh, but that seems wrong too. People generally seem when they go to the store to actually be aware of what they're getting. They're often very specific. I want this brand or this, there's a problem with this. It may look like it's, it may look like it's a good deal, but actually you get such a large quantity, you might be throwing out most of it. People do look at prices often when they're shopping, right? So why then would it be that people would be rational in some areas of life and irrational in others? And the big story that I push in Myth, Myth of the Rational Voter is that when you are shopping for yourself, if you have irrational beliefs, you suffer. If you buy fish and you don't like fish, then you waste your money and you don't have food that you want. This is what's going on when people are spending their own money. On the other hand, when people vote, because one vote makes very little difference for the outcome, the way that you vote has almost no effect on the policies you live under, which means that it is perfectly safe to vote for crazy things. It is perfectly safe to go into the voting booth and vote at random. It is also perfectly safe to go in there and vote on the basis of an absurd philosophy or ideology. And this is what I say people in fact do. The same person who is totally reasonable in real life will have and will apply a much lower level of intellectual effort to politics. And as a result, they have views that are simple-minded, confused, hateful, or otherwise driven by emotion. Uh, here, honestly, I'm always thinking about my dad, who is a thinly disguised character in the book. Uh, he's the shrewd businessman, if you go and read it. I don't know how you translate shrewd businessman in Danish, right? But uh, what do you do? I don't know. Is it like German? Do you say like klug or something like that? I don't, I don't know. But anyway, my dad is a PhD in electrical engineering. He is a very smart guy. He is an antique car restorer. He is someone with great practical skill. If I was stuck on a desert island, he is one of my friends who is most likely to be able to help me build a boat and get me off the island. But his political views, it's not just that I disagree with him. They're just very foolish. They are obviously driven by anger. He just, just consults his feelings. I am angry about this. All right. And, and there are people that I'm angry. <coughs> I'm angry about this issue. These are some people that I'm angry against. So the people I'm angry against must be the problem. They must be the cause. All right. So my dad is angry about foreigners. Therefore, foreigners must be causing Americans economic problems. I can't remember what is in the book, but yes, my I, it is barely an exaggeration to say that my dad thinks that all of Americans' economic problems could be solved by a naval blockade of Asia and a Berlin Wall at the Mexican border. Right? And you know, as for why this is, it's not like my dad has read the textbook and found an error. He just has no idea what's in the textbook, but he does know he does not like foreigners, and so he scapegoats them for these problems. Um, now. 
how do we really know that the story is correct? Right? How do you say, like, we can see or seems like people are, are at least a lot more rational as consumers than they are as voters. Um, you know, one possibility of those, well, maybe politics is just a more emotional subject intrinsically, something like that. Uh, here I say that the best evidence is what happens when you offer a bet. People often make extremely hyperbolic, extremely hyperbolic, you make hyperbolic claims about politics such as X will certainly cause Y. This will be a complete disaster. If the Democrats are elected, the United States economy will be destroyed in a matter of weeks. All right, this is the way that people talk about politics. And yet, if you then say, all right, that's what you believe, how, why do we not bet on this? Let's make a bet. So if US GDP falls by 50% within the first month of Biden's administration, then I will give you $100. Otherwise, you give me $100. Or if the person expresses great confidence, then it also makes sense for, to say, well, since you're so confident, you should give me 10 to 1 odds. All right. In practice, when people make hyperbolic statements about politics, when you offer to bet them, they almost never accept the bets that would be implied by their official statement. Instead, they either suddenly tone it down or just don't want it bet. I know this because one of my hobbies is publicly betting people who say things relevant to politics that I think are crazy. It is very hard to get people to bet on their outrageous statements, which I say shows that on some level they know that they are wrong. On some deep level, they actually realize that what they're saying is intellectually irresponsible. They're applying low standards. Probably not at the moment of speaking, but when you go and challenge them, this is where they're faced with the reality. Ah, I form this belief in an intellectually low quality way, and so I don't want to go and bet my house that what I said was actually true. Also, using these methods, I have a you know, long series of bets. If you go and Google, my name and uh, bet wiki, <laughs> bet wiki. I have a list of all the public bets that I have made and the resolution. Uh, right now I have won 23 out of 23 bets that have resolved. Uh, so I say these are, these are cases where I'm betting the people that don't seem to realize that they're wrong. But uh, important to remember, almost all these bets, the person originally said something much more extreme and then to get them to bet, I had to go and offer terms that were much more favorable than their actual previous statements entitled them. Uh, for example, the closest to losing I ever came was a bet with Canadian political commentator Mark Stein. So in the early 2000s, he said that the European Union was on the brink of collapse. And then to get into bet, I said, all right, I'll bet you that no current member of the EU with a population over 10 million exits the EU by January 1st, 2020. Right now, he said it will collapse very soon. And I gave him a bet where I said, if any country leaves by 2020, at least before January 1st, 2020, then you win. Much more generously he's entitled to. As you probably know, due to Brexit, I almost lost. But while I almost lost the bet, this in no way showed that his original statement was even remotely correct. Rather, I just bargained with him in order to get him to agree to a bet to prove a point. This is how these bets usually work. Anyway, but what do we learn from betting? What we learn is that rationality itself does respond to incentives. When someone speaks knowing that there's no direct consequence of being wrong, then they apply very low intellectual standards. It doesn't mean they're lying exactly, it just means that they aren't trying to, be, to think about the truth. They're just going with their gut. On the other hand, when you offer that same person a bet, you'll see that they almost always back down and at least tone down what they're saying because they don't want to lose their home in a, in a bet where the, claim, on a, where the claim is just extraordinarily unlikely to be true. All right. Now, the problem with politics is that you aren't betting in politics. So in politics, we get to see people at their worst, which is, I say, what we are getting. Now, since I'm talking to Denmark, uh, there is a common view in the United States that you Scandinavians are the most rational voters in the world and you're a lot better than us. That may be a little bit true, uh, but I think that mostly that's because 
American political scientists want the orthopolicies that you have for America. It's not that they've actually independently judged the rationality of Scandinavians. I, uh, since I'm talking to you guys, let me go and point out some of the areas where I think Scandinavians are the worst. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, good, I got a laugh, all right. Um, yeah, so, like, here is what I will say is one of the most irrational economic policies that a country can have. Any universal social welfare program is a terrible idea. Regardless, any program where everyone gets retirement money, where everyone gets child care money, where everyone gets health care, we know that these are bad ideas. Why? because it requires us to tax everyone, to subsidize everyone, which is almost the definition of futility. Taxing some people to help other people can be logical. Taxing everyone to help everyone is illogical. What is the point? It is an exercise in futility, right? Now, especially when you realize those taxes cause disincentives. So means-tested programs, programs where you say, let's tax the richest 80% to help the poorest 20%. That can make sense, right? And also programs like that tend to be small and therefore require low taxes to fund them because you aren't wasting most of your money on people who do not need help. The logic of this is pretty simple. Right? If you were a very rich person, if you were Elon Musk, and you wanted to give away $7.5 billion in charity, would you give one dollar to each person on earth? That would be madness, completely absurd. That's the best idea you got to give a dollar to every human. Why not take that money and focus it on people that actually have a serious problem? Why not start with the war orphans? Why give it to a dollar to everyone on earth, a dollar for each war orphan, a dollar for every Danish millionaire? It's simply folly. And yet, Every country on earth has programs like this, and guess what? Yeah, you Scandinavians are probably the worst of the worst for these, <laughs> for these universal programs. Right? Why do people have them? I think it's almost all emotional. It's like, okay, well, oh, it's really great to go and help and, and make sure that every single person gets what they need. Do you really need to give money to everyone to make sure that everyone gets what they need? If you had means testing, could you still not be, uh, be sure that the billionaires will be able to go and afford their retirement? Furthermore, even the standard of we have to be sure that every Dane has what they need. What's so important about being sure? How about isn't 99.99% good enough? What if the cost of going from 99.99% uh, certainty to 100% is a trillion dollars a year? What then? All right. So... Uh, now, the only argument you ever really hear from social scientists about this is, well, the only way that we can maintain the welfare state at all is by tricking voters, by telling them that they're getting something out of it, even when on net they are losers. Um, we can talk about that more in the question and answer, but this is an argument that many smart people have made, and yet it is obviously false. Almost every country also has a bunch of means tested programs. They are not tiny programs. To say you simply cannot sustain a welfare state without universal without universality is again just completely wrong. And yes, as you guys know, this is an enormous part of your budget. Scandinavia could drastically reduce government spending, drastically reduce taxes, still take care of the very poorest people in your countries, just by admitting that the approach that you're using, though it sounds good, is in fact very foolish. All right, so I think I will leave it there and now turn it over to questions. Thank you very much, CPOS and Denmark. Okay. Thank you very much, Brian. And of course, in, in the confusion of people coming in, I forgot to introduce you. And it's a little bit silly to do it now, but you've just heard the great Brian Kaplan, who is Professor of Economics at George Mason University. And on top of this book, he's written a lot of other books. Um, uh, but it's worth mentioning that the myth of the rational voter was uh, named the best political book of the year by the New York Times. And um, that one of Kaplan's other books is called um, The Case... Sorry, um, uh, Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids. How many kids do you have, Brian? Only four. 
for. So here's a man who uh, preaches, uh, who who, um, who practices what he he preaches. Now let's go to uh, to questions, and I think what we'll do uh, is. We'll take a couple of questions, and you do realize that this is going online, obviously, otherwise Brian couldn't see it, but we're also recording it. So um, uh, if you don't want to be recorded, don't ask a question. And uh, please be brief, because we only have a short, uh, a short interval for this. And, and please present yourself. My name is Malcolm Bang, um, and I have a question based in theoretical economics with, with practical implications. I was looking for Wilfred Perito, the Italian economist, in your references uh, uh, without uh, any luck. Uh, so my question is uh, two areas he wrote extensively about. The one is irrationality of the voter uh, and, and efficiency. So my question is where, where you are talking about general economic efficiency from a macro perspective, not about different interests. So my question is that this perceived irrationality, um, could it, uh, to a certain extent, be explained by different interests? For example, interest in redistribution. And regarding the efficiency issue, uh, as I understand, the Scandinavian healthcare model is far cheaper, it's about half price, and more efficient leads to a, a, a longer life expect expectancy the American model, uh, mainly because of efficiency of scale. Uh, and the same with the public health care system in Cuba, where life expectancy in a developing country is longer than the, in the United States. Okay, we'll take one more question. I saw somebody down here. I mean, I'm, I'm going to start for you forgetting if I don't answer them. Okay, one. answer this one and then we'll go to the next one. Fine, Brian. Yes. I thought you were a professor. <laughs> well, um, so on Vilfredo Pareto, um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure he's in there. I do quote a bunch of the other elitist uh, Italian political scientists of that period. So maybe somehow he didn't get quoted. Uh, but in any case, obviously, he's one of the greats. I'm almost sure I've got quotes from Machiavelli, Gitona Mosca. Uh, yeah, so you know, the Italian political tradition of cynically analyzing politics is one of their best intellectual exports. So big fan of that. <laughs> In terms of economic efficiency, uh, yeah. So, uh, real quick, uh, there are, you know, so Pareto is famous for introducing the standard of Pareto efficiency into economics, of just saying that we're going to call something efficient if there's no way to make one person better off without making another person worse off. This is one that in economic theory plays a great role. Uh, in practice, however, this is a completely worthless standard because it describes every known society in all of human history. Even Stalinist Soviet Union is Pareto efficient. Why? Because there are some fanatical communists who don't want to deviate from Stalinist policy. They really care. And to go and move even slightly away from those terrible policies makes them worse off. Uh, economists always say, well, we could compensate them. Well, yeah, practice compensation is super hard. So anyway, um, not to go into too much detail, but uh, if you go to my the, my course notes for my PhD microeconomics class, uh, week one, there I explain, and I will just say prove, Pareto efficiency is fine for economic theory, fine for homework problems. It is a completely worthless standard for analyzing anything in the real world because 100% of all societies count as efficient, no matter how awful they are. The one that I'm using is what's usually called counter Hicks efficiency. This is one where we just say, let's add up the dollar values and costs of everything and see what maximizes the dollar value. So that's the one that I'm actually using. This is also just called cost benefit analysis. It's the one that is useful. It's the one that economists use to understand things. This is the standard, for example, that shows why COVID policy was a gross overreaction because we can go and look and see well, what's the value of the life saved? What is the loss of quality of life measured in the same by the same measure of loss of time? And then to see that what we did was ridiculous. Uh, the healthcare now, system. Yes, on the healthcare system. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I am. I think it's quite likely actually that the Danish healthcare system is better than the U.S. one because the U.S. has a terrible one where we spend an enormous amount of government money on healthcare. And we waste almost all of it, all right? So the U.S. basically has an especially absurd view, where if where most people are not eligible, but if you are eligible, we will pay any amount, no matter how much, for even the smallest problem. 
right? And as a result, we spend more money, you know, our government spends more per person than most other countries in the world, probably more than Denmark. And then we also have a lot of private spending on top of that. I don't think this has anything to do with scale economies. I think that what's going on is that you guys just waste a lot less money than we do. Uh, and in particular, because we have this, uh, this very silly standard of health at any cost. Uh, the Cuban numbers, though, I just say are completely bogus. Never trust any official statistics of a communist government. This is a rule that is not always true. But nevertheless, until you are able to go in there and look at all of their official documents and have an un unrestricted access, don't believe a word they say. Right. Uh, so I have friends who work on Cuban numbers. Uh, they are greatly are probably greatly hiding infant mortality for starters. Uh, also worth pointing out uh, that there is a large research literature where the consensus is that healthcare is just a greatly over overestimated factor in life expectancy. It is much more about diet and exercise, lifestyle. Uh, Belize is also a country where they have a life expectancy comparable to the United States, right? They're much poorer. So as to what's going on, it's an interesting question. But in any case, uh, one of the main gains in Cuban life expectancy actually came after the collapse of the Soviet Union when their GDP crashed. They didn't have enough money for food and the entire country lost weight. All right, so in a sense, you could say, all right, well, Cuba's good for health because it's hard to get food there. Right. <laughs> okay, we'll take the next likely. question. Yeah, all right. So, you know, so Denmark might be better than the U.S. Cuba sucks, 100%, sure. 99.99, .99. fine. <laughs> uh, certainly, uh, Brian, I want to start off by thanking you for writing a great oh, Sorry, speak up, please. It's hard, oh, hard to hear. Can you hear me now? That's best. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I just want to start out by thanking you for writing an excellent book. It, uh, it gave You're me welcome. a great many insights. Um, I was actually wondering if, I don't know if it's a difficult question, but do you believe that social media is that um, increasing or decreasing the opinion gap between uh, economists and the general public? I mean, Twitter, that's a Facebook, that's a, yeah, that's a whatever, podcasting. Question. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic question. Uh, here is the unfortunate reality. There's a lot of evidence that the, econ the U.S. economics profession has moved left in the last 25 years. I actually tried to make the original foundation that did the survey on which I based the book redo it well on the 25-year anniversary, but I was not able to convince them to do it. But there's a lot of other evidence that the U.S. economics profession has moved left, um, and by quite a bit, especially young ones. Uh, one story is they've learned something and now they realize that previous economists are wrong. I don't think that's actually true. But in any case, what we see is that the economics profession has moved left and then economically, probably the U.S. public has moved left as well. Uh, you know, again, this is possibly, you, know, again, like you, you, could, you could argue this is all for the best. I don't think so. But anyway, since both have moved and moved in a left wing direction, uh, you know, like, you know, in terms of that gap, uh, it's not clear that there is a difference in the gap for social media to explain. I mean, I would, the main thing that I'm confident that social media does is it increases the spread of opinion. There's just a lot more weird and eccentric views that are, that now have adherence. When I was a teenager, there were a lot of people with weird views, but they had no audience. So each person with a weird view was just one person by himself, maybe bothering his family. Now, if you are an energetic person with a weird view, you might have 10,000 YouTube followers. So I think that is giving a larger spread in opinion. Although I think the main thing that social media does is it reveals a, a lot of voices that were always there, but just didn't have a platform. And now we find out just how crazy people are. And many people <laughs> have said that a lot of what social media is doing is it's showing people the true ugliness of their opponents, <laughs> okay. or at least the, showing them the ugliest opponents they have, which previously they never would have been aware of or, or meet. So I think that's the main thing social media is doing. But I will say that it's really complicated, and I don't think that very much really good research has been done. But maybe you could do it, and then I, I will blog it if you do something good. Okay, thanks. We'll take one more question. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so I thought... I thought there was a question there, but there wasn't. So I'll ask you a question, Brian. Um, you also talk about um, the um, so there's rational ignorance, 
but there's also no rational irrationality. So it is not just a question of people not knowing, but of people uh, even... Uh, you, you hint at it uh, when, when you say that somebody might actually deep down know, mm -hmm. but they still say crazy things. Could you talk yes. a, little about, uh, a, a little bit about rational irrationality? Uh, sure. All right. So rational ignorance is a concept that has been around for a long time. It's very simple. It just says that some things are not worth knowing. And when they are not worth knowing, it is rational to be ignorant. Right. For most people, there is no point in understanding the history of ancient Assyria, and therefore they don't bother. They realize it wouldn't help them, so they don't put time into it, and as a result, they know not, almost nothing about it. They're rationally ignorant. In politics, people have used this to say, well, it doesn't really pay one voter to know exactly how Danish dairy subsidies work, and so the typical person does not know, whereas the Danish dairy industry, on the other hand, does know. All right, so that's rational ignorance. That was around long before me. Uh, all perfectly fine idea. It has plenty of good examples, but to me, it did miss what struck me as being much more important, which is people, which is fanaticism. It's one thing for someone to be apathetic about politics, but we also see fanaticism. We see people who, on the one hand, they know almost nothing. They don't understand the other side's views. They barely understand their own views, but they still are really committed, enthusiastic, they are not people who say they're ignorant. They're people who claim to know, even though you may say, well, how could you know? You don't really study the subject. You're just consulting your anger, dad. Right, so <laughs> for that, I, I said, well, I said, well, like, it's very helpful to think of there being another epistemic flaw, which I call rational rationality. This is where in issues where you, where on some level you realize it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, then you, rather than just not knowing anything about it, you turn down your level of intellectual effort. You take your dial of how hard am I gonna think about this and turn it down to a really low level or maybe just turn it off. And when you do that, you can believe almost anything. So Brian, this what should is, be done about it? Um, I look yeah. at what's going on in the US where you have even top politicians claiming something which is blatantly untrue about uh, your election. Uh, now, this is threatening to democracy itself in some even, ways. What, what can top, be done about it? Top. Sorry? <laughs> now, even top, especially the top, is bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I, I met some go. local Colorado officials la uh, last week. They didn't seem completely crazy. You know, they, they were just talking about local issues and water. It's like, all right, this person seems to know a little bit. It's the people at the top who are probably the worst. Uh, what can be done about it? Well, here, I see so you guys have Alcoholics Anonymous in Denmark, right? Right, yes. Right, and the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous is admitting that you have a problem. <laughs> I have a drinking problem. All right, we have a voting problem. We have a voter irrationality problem. The system works poorly. I say step one is just admitting this. That's a lot of what my book tries to do, is to stop praising democracy, stop being romantic about it, stop saying, Oh, democracy, it's so wonderful. Oh, in a democracy. All right, just knock all of that religion off and just face facts. It's a system which is better than some. It's better than dictatorship, but it's not a great system. It is a flawed system. It has many problems. The fact that something's popular doesn't mean it's a good idea. Truth does not win in the end. Just to go and, and, and make that point, I think, is a big step forward. And then once you can get people to admit that, then you can finally have a conversation about what could be done. Um, as I say in the book, there is a general problem, which is that if you get people to admit that they are irrational, you could probably get them to stop. But, you know, there is what we call a catch-22. Do you guys say catch-22 in Danish? Yes. All right, excellent. Uh, the original novel, Catch-22, the catch-22 is there is an American fighter pilot. He tells the, he tells his commanders look i'm going crazy i don't belong in a plane and they say no one who is crazy would go and say they were crazy so get back in the plane and he says fine i'm not crazy and they say okay great then get back in the plane so no matter what you do you end up having to be a fighter pilot all right so in the case of democracy the problem is that if you, you if you could get people to actually take their own flaws seriously you probably could fix them uh, but the problem is that how do you convince an irrational person of their own irrationality? It's tough. Uh, 
I do talk about things like constitutional reforms. Again, the main problem there is to get a constitutional reform, you got to convince people that democracy isn't working. And as long as they're irrational, that is hard. Uh, the things that we definitely can do. So one of them is just trying to correct people's thinking, improve what they're saying, point out what's really going on. Is it uh, a really effective remedy? No, but it does help. Things like that think tanks like CPOS do, where you just try to raise the quality of discussion, try to make it a bit more awkward to be completely unreasonable in politics. That is one thing that pushes things in the right direction. And the other thing you can do is if you ever happen to have power and you can go and deliver policies better than voters want without losing office, I say, do it guilt free, right? Given how irrational voters are, if you can get away with making policy better than voters want, you should do it without in any way having a bad conscience about it. If you're ever in the position to give Denmark more free trade than Danes want, give them more free trade. Give them what they give them what is good for them, rather than what that they irrationally think they want. And if you ever say, "Well, isn't that paternalistic?" Remember, this is not really paternalism because someone who's irrational doesn't just hurt himself in politics; you're hurting everyone else too. So, just to close, I've had the same argument with my colleague Pete Betke several times. He says, well, Brian, what you're saying is we get the government we deserve. And I say, no, Pete, I'm saying we get the government they deserve. <laughs> and that's the problem. Okay. Right, thank so you very thank much, you very Brian. Much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Martin, for everything you've done. Hope to be back in Denmark sometime soon. Uh, and uh, you know, while this is all going on, uh, well, let's do you know, great. Anyway, great talking to you guys again. I miss you all. Bye. Bye-bye. Og vi iler videre på dansk med øhm, Martin Vines, som er lektor ved Aarhus Universitet øh, og blandt andet forsker i borgernes politiske adfærd. Men nu har vi, for, får vi sådan en politolog på banen i stedet for en økonom. Øh, Martin har publiceret flittigt i øh, videnskabelige tidsskrifter her under nogle af, af de bedste på markedet faktisk, øh, så som... American Political Science Review og British Journal of Political Science. Værsgo, Martin. Tak fordi du vil komme. Ordet er dit. Super, tak. Ja. Sådan der. Nu tror jeg, der er lyd igennem. Uh, yes. Uh, jeg synes, det er super fedt, I holder sådan nogle arrangementer her. Og uh, beskæftiger jer med, ikke bare med, kan man sige, økonomiske idéer, men også idéer omkring, hvordan vi kan, kan forbedre, eller i hvert fald måske bedre forstå demokratiet. Så øh, jeg synes, det, det er en, en spændende bog, som I, øh, I udgiver i dag på dansk. Det er, en, det er en god bog, også en ret provokerende bog, øh, som jeg også kan høre her. Den har ret mange provokerende pointer. Ikke siger basically, at vi er alle sammen nogle, nogle fjolser. Øh, sådan i, I statskundskabslitteraturen, der er der en række folk, der kritiserer demokratiet øh, fra en række forskellige vinkler. Det, de typisk fokuserer på, det er det, er det man, som man kan kalde særinteresser, det vil sige fagforeninger eller, eller virksomheder eller sådan bestemte kommuner, som prøver på en eller anden måde at tage øh, det, der egentlig er alles interesse, så for at kunne gøre det hen i, i deres interesse. Ikke? Så en fagforening, der siger, at vi skal bare sørge for at skabe højere løn til vores øh, medlemmer, bedre forhold for vores medlemmer, så er vi ligeglade med dem, der ikke er medlem af vores fagforening. Eller en virksomhed, som siger, at vi skal bare have højere profit, ikke, øh, ikke alle mulige andre. Måske er der også nogen, der vil putte put Sebers, nogen på den yderste venstrefløj, der vil putte Sebers i den kategori. Altså en, 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 nogen, der, der tjener sær eh, interesser. Men det, der er, er interessant ved, ved, ved Kaplan, som han har øh, præsenteret her, det er, at han giver en eller anden sted også alle sammen skylden. Øh, og siger, at det, det er ikke fordi, at der er nogen, øh, hvad hedder det, øh, nogen der er, hvad hedder det, snupper øh, magten i demokratiet. Nej, det er demokratiet som sådan, der er, der er problemet. Og jeg synes grundlæggende, at hvis man ser på de ting, som, som han nævner, Kaplan, som skaber grundlaget for det her problem, så er de også 100% til stede i, i Danmark. Der er også en meget svag sammenhæng mellem, hvad man går ned og stemmer, og hvad den førte politik egentlig bliver. Altså det er den enkelte person i Danmark har også meget lille, lille indflydelse på, om skatten bliver sat op eller ned, eller på om hvad hedder det, vi skal have færre eller flere, øh, hvad hedder det, op til færre eller, øh, eller flere asylansøgere. Og måske kan man da sige det endnu værre i Danmark, fordi... I øh, USA, der vil du jo tit faktisk gå hen og stemme direkte på den regering, der skal, skal nedsætte den, den førte øh, politik. Hvor i Danmark, der er 
stemmer vi jo på nogle partier, der så laver en eller anden revkage på Christiansborg og finder ud af, hvad skal der så rent faktisk ske. Øhm, så jeg synes, det den, den samme struktur, som, som Kaplund peger på, er der også i, øh, i Danmark. Danskerne er også i høj grad, når man ser på meningsmålinger, skeptiske både over for, for markeder og, og de fremmede, altså for, for, for indvandrere og for øh, øh, hvad hedder det, internationale virksomheder, multinationale selskaber, som man jo øh, også kalder det. Øh, og danskerne er også generelt set ret negativ. De har en grundlæggende idé om, at tingene bliver, bliver værre over tid. Og de også, øh, det som øh, øh, Kaplan kalder, de fokuserer på sådan noget make work, eller de får de meget hvad jeg har kaldt efterspørgselsfokuseret. Ikke? De, de tænker ikke så meget på, jamen, øh, hvad hedder det, hvordan skal vi sørge for at gøre øh, samfundskagen større? Det er mere et fokus på, når man, øh, hvad hedder det, hvor, hvorhen er det, skal vi, hvor skal vi bruge af den? En ting, som jeg vil tilføje, som jeg synes er, er, er en, en, måske en, en sjov ting, der ikke står så meget om i, øh, i Kaplens bog, det er, at øh, danskerne, og jeg tror også, amerikanerne er typisk ret kortsigtede. Altså folk tænker typisk, øh, har øh, ikke et perspektiv, som altid går på, jamen, hvad, hvad vil være godt om 5, 10 eller 20 år. Æ, folk tænker i højere grad ligesom på, hvad vil være godt her og nu æ, for samfundet. Og det kan også godt skabe æ, nogle problemer, for eksempel, at man måske investerer for lidt i at bekæmpe klimaforandringer. Tak. Æm, så æ, grundlæggende set, synes jeg egentlig, at, at Kaplan's analyse her er æ, også i et eller andet omfang kan være dækkende for, for Danmark. Øhm, når jeg så sidder og læser den her, øh, genlæser den, øh, den her uge, så synes jeg alligevel, at der er nogle udfordringer, man kan, øh, man kan komme med. Og så jeg valgt lige at fokusere ganske kort her på, på tre udfordringer fra en, fra en dansk læser. Øh, det første der er en eller anden spørgsmålstegn ved det hvor dårlig politik er det egentlig, at vi efterspørger øh, den, ja, os danskere. Og så er jeg jo prøve at se på, om vi ikke lærer vi måske over tid at blive, blive klogere. Og så til sidst, om der ikke er plads måske alligevel, på trods af, at vælgerne er så irrationelle, til at politikerne udvider sig lederskab, og øh, hvad hedder det, er med til at informere borgernes holdninger til det bedre. Så øh, til at starte med, så, så tænker jeg, hvad vil være en rigtig god test af Kaplans case her med de irrationelle vælger? Det er øh, en afstemning, vi havde i Danmark for 22 år, år siden, øh, om hvorvidt vi skulle deltage i eurosamarbejdet. Øh, det var der en stor politisk debat om, og den var præget i høj grad af, det, som øh, Kaplan kalder foreign bias, altså folk, der var imod det, det handlede meget om, der var noget, der kom udefra, som var utrygt, og der var nogen, der ville udskifte kronen. Og hvis man spurgte danske økonomer, jamen, så var de relativt sammenstemmende helt klar på, at hvis Danmark de skal droppe kronen, og de skal, sige, øh, de skal sige ja til euroen. Så jeg har samlet en lille udsnit af økonomer, der anbefalede at stemme ja. Så der er fx Jørgen Rosted, der var tidligere departementchef, Christian Sørensen, vismand, Bodil Nyb Andersen, nationalbankdirektør, tidligere nationalbankdirektør, og Erik Hofmeier, tidligere nationalbankdirektør. Øh, danskerne valgte jo at stemme nej. Og øh, det er måske alligevel et tilfælde, hvor at danskerne i et eller andet omfang var klogere end de her rigtig kloge økonomer. Men siden da har der jo bare været øh, hvad hedder det, den ene efter den anden krise øh, hvad hedder det, i eurosamarbejdet. Og øh, hvad hedder det, i hvert fald tre ud af de her fire øh, økonomer øh, har også senere været ude og sige, at det, det var måske ikke lige så smart, at vi, øh, at vi pegede på et, et ja dengang. Det var nok været bedre at, at bevare kronen. Nummer 4 er ikke død, men hun, hun trækker stadig lidt på det. <laughs> øh, af uforståelige årsager. Så jeg synes, det giver lidt et blik for, at, at jo, altså, vi kan godt sige, at vælger er super irrationelle, fordi de ikke handler på, øh, hvad der ligesom er up-to-date økonomisk visdom. Men nogle gange kan det også godt være, at måske er der en eller anden vælger havde en eller anden konservativ snusfornuft, som alligevel er vigtig at lytte til i demokrati, og som også kan være med til at skabe noget, noget politisk stabilitet, og også gøre, at man øh, måske ikke bare, øh, som Kaplan foreslår i morgen, afskaffer alle universelle ydelser, og bare tænker, at det skal nok gå. Øh, en anden ting, øh, det, hvad hedder det, øh, ifølge det, det er også det her med, med bias mod, mod, mod de fremmede, så Kaplan er jo, som han selv nævner, stor fortaler for, øh, for migration. Ikke? Han har skrevet den her bog, Open Borders, The Science and Ethics of Immigration. Og det er ikke en, en diskussion, det er bare fordi han mener, at der skal grundlæggende være, være åbne grænser. Det er der mange danskere, som, som ikke mener. Øh, og det, øh, hvad hedder det, det er klart, en, en, kan man sige, den her hold, den her skeptis til over for øh, hvad hedder det, indvandring i Danmark, er ikke noget, som politikere eller eliter har fundet på. Uh, her har jeg uh, taget nogle survey-data med her, fra, som går fra 87 og til i dag, som viser, hvor mange danskere, som mener, at indvandring er en, en trussel mod national egenart. Det, man grundlæggende kan se, det er, det er 
at der er ikke, de, den holdning har grundlæggende ikke udviklet sig siden øh, 87. Et, et flertal af danskerne mener, eller cirka halvdelen af danskerne mener, at det er en trussel mod den, den nationale egenart. Og den her grundlæggende skepsis øh, var i høj grad ikke til stede i 87 blandt folketingspolitikere og økonomer og andre dele af den, den politiske og økonomiske elite, men øh, er jo siden da noget, som, som øh, hvad hedder det, øh, politikerne har valgt at lytte til. Og det kan man så sige, at det så ikke bare en, et, et resultat af noget af det, som vi ser hos Kaplan, det her med, at vælgerne har nogle irrationelle holdninger, men, øh, og hvad hedder det, så lytter øh, politikerne til, men det, det synes jeg faktisk ikke, det er en så god øh, case på. Øhm, for det første så vil jeg sige, at når man taler med danske politikere om det her, det kan være også, at Ole kan komme ind på det her, det er, at, at danske politikere er i høj grad true believers, når det kommer til de her øh, hvad hedder det, stramninger, øh, den her stram indvandrerpolitik. Måske er lidt forskellige grunde. Nogle mener, det er for at bevare velfærdsstaten, nogle mener, det er for at bevare øh, hvad hedder det, sammenhængskraft, men grundlæggende set, ikke, så er det ikke noget, som øh, politikerne føler, at vælgerne har snydt til. De har grundlæggende set ændret holdninger på baggrund af, øh, hvad hedder det, de, har, de har lært af at lytte til deres vælgere. Endelig kan man også sige, at, at uh, Sveriges uh, eksperiment med at have en, en, en meget anden politik, som gik imod deres befolkning, er jo også i høj grad nu slut. Ikke? Det er igen et tegn på, at måske er vælgerne ikke så, uh, så tossede endda. Og måske også måske et lidt et tegn på, at kan man nogle gange overse ikke politiske mål. Det kan fx være lighed, som der også var nogen, der var inde for i spørgsmålet, men også noget måske med sikkerhed eller fravær af kriminalitet, som måde, at, uh, at borgerne også gerne vil have ud over økonomisk vækst. Yes. Den sidste ting, som jeg lige ville se på her, det var, om, om der egentlig er tegn på, at, at vælgerne lærer over tid. Og øh, der synes jeg, vi har en, en interessant case i, i Danmark her, øh, som er, at øh, i, i 70'erne, og øh, hvad hedder det, der havde vi jo, ligesom vi har nu, en, en meget stor inflationskrise, men vi havde også et meget stort problem med offentlig gæld. Øh, vi har... Øh, på de her billeder her til længst til højre, øh, to socialdemokratiske statsminister fra 70'erne, Jens Otto Krav og Anker Jørgensen, der øh, hvad hedder det, var øh, i, i, hvad hedder det, i, spids, stod i spidsen fra regeringer, der lå øh, hvad hedder det, den danske gæld stige ganske betragteligt, som vi kan se Hans Bischof forklarer i Danmarks Radio, dengang de virkelig kunne lave gode grafikker øh, ude til, øh, til venstre, øh, som jo så lige til at øh, Knud Heinesen i midten sagde i, i, øh, i starten af 80'erne, at vi var på vej ud over, over afgrunden. Og igen det her med sådan, gældsfinansieret politik, ikke? Æ, igen noget som øh, Kaplan siger, det er jo drevet af de her irrationelle vælgere, Æ, og det er et problem, der er meget svært at løse, fordi at øh, hvad hedder det, vælgerne de vil bare have, at, at politikerne skal bruge penge på at løse problemerne, men de gider ikke betale regningen. Men hvis vi så på, hvordan det er gået siden da, så har jeg til venstre her den, den offentlige gæld, som vi kan se steg betragtet i løbet af, af 60'erne og 70'erne, men som siden da er faldet. Og øh, også nu øh, i dag, på trods af coronakrise og så videre, er meget lav. Øh, så det tyder altså på, at vælgerne i et eller andet omfang har øh, måske lært af den her kri- krisetid, vi var i 70'erne, og er blevet meget sensitiv over for, hvis folk, at folk ikke vil, øh, øh, altså hvis folk bare vil bruge penge, uden at, øh, at altså det bliver finansieret. Øh, og et godt eksempel på, at både politikere og og vælger at er villige til at gå langt for ikke at have ufinansieret politik, øh, det er, øh, synes jeg, er, at den her øh, efterlønsreform, som ny og i, i 90'erne, som i høj grad var noget, han gjorde, fordi at han, øh, altså, han havde jo i, i løbet af valget i, i, hvad hedder det, i 98, så han lovet, det er den garanti, der ligger der, her er en garanti, skriftlig garanti for, at jeg ikke ændrer efterløn. Året efter går han sendt alligevel og skal i efterløn. Og hvorfor gør han det? Jamen, det gør han til dels for at bremse lidt op i økonomien, men i lige så høj grad gør han det også, fordi at han øh, ønsker øh, at, hvad hedder det, at skabe større finanspolitisk holdbarhed. Han ønsker, at vi ikke skal ende i sådan en situation igen, hvor at vi har øh, sti, hvad hedder det, en, en stigning øh, offentlig gæld. Øh, så kan man sige, at man bliver så ikke straffet ekstremt meget af det her vælgerne. Jeg har i en, 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 en nylig artikel i, i Politisk har jeg faktisk fundet ud af, at nej, ja, det gjorde han ikke. Altså, det er rigtigt nok, der var nogle vælgere, som gik fra Socialdemokratiet og til øh, de nogle mere venstreorienterede partier, nogle vælgere, som gerne ville have en mere, øh, en mere venstreorienteret fordelingspolitik. Men faktisk, de vælgere, der gik over midten ved det valg, det var ikke på grund af det her nye efterløns, øh, øh, det her med, at Nyup, han, øh, han brød det her løfte omkring efterlønnen. Nej, det var på grund af indvandrerpolitikken, som vi tog tidligere. Det vil sige, der er altså noget i en dansk i de danske vælgere, hvor de har fået jævet sig en skræk i livet, virker det som om, og at de altså selv i høj grad 
gennemsnitlig set i hvert fald sætter pris på, at hvis man skal bruge nogle penge, så skal det finansieres. Og det synes jeg også, vi kan se i den nuværende valgkamp, hvor at alle øh, hvad hedder det, seriøse partier jo skal have en 2030-skatteplan, hvor at man sørger for at balancere indtægter og udgifter, sådan som man ikke skaber øh, hvad hedder det, større udgifter. Sådan er det altså langt fra i alle lande, at partier fremlægger sådan nogle langsigtede øh, nogle, nogle, øh, planer, hvor der er langsigtet holdbarhed. Okay, hvis jeg har et par minutter mere, har jeg det? Du må gerne lige runde hurtigt af. Men gerne jeg, på jeg runder hurtigt af. Det sidste, jeg bare vil sige, og det var det her med, med, med politisk øh, lederskab, og det er, at jeg tror godt egentlig, at der er plads til, at politikere også kan være med til at informere borgernes holdninger. Og jeg synes, et godt eksempel på det, det har været den, den boligskatreform, som nu har, på grund af, de, på grund af ejendomsvurderinger, at der er gået lidt tid for, at den er blevet implementeret. Den boligskatreform, der blev lavet øh, i, i 2019, øh, hvor man... Øh, så gik sammen på tværs af, af partierne, og jeg sagde nu, at vi har en, et, en, et problem med nogle øh, boligskatter, øh, som er, foregår på en meget uretfærdig måde. Det er et svært problem. Hvis vi går sammen på tværs af partierne, kan vi så ikke løse det på en måde, øh, som er, er fornuftig, og som øh, kan øh, hvad det, overbevise vælgerne om, at der er altså et vigtigt problem her, der kan løses. Så der vil jeg bare sige, at jeg har igen et, et nyligt studie på at se på, jamen, da den her øh, reform blev meldt ud, jamen, var det så sådan, at vælgerne på sådan en irrationel måde, bare igen og straffede politikerne, hvis de gik efter deres private økonomi. Nej, der viste sig faktisk, at hvis politikerne, politikere man stoler på, kommer med gode argumenter for, hvorfor at man for eksempel som lejlighedsejer i øh, storbyen, skal betale lidt mere i skat, fordi at, at man har meget skæve ejendomsvurderinger over tid, jamen så køber folk faktisk de argumenter. Så bare for at absolut sige, at jeg synes, at kan, det er fantastisk med Kaplan's niveau her, myten om et irrationelt vælger, men vi skal også passe på, at vi ikke gør vælgerne alt for irrationelt. Tak. Og vi iler videre. Ole Birk Olsen, medlem af Folketinget for Liberale Alliance, tidligere transport-, bygnings- og boligminister, uddannet på Danmarks Journalisthøjskole, har arbejdet på Ekstrabladet Berlingske Tiden som journalist, har været chefredaktør på sit eget netmedie 180 grader og forfatter til bogen Taberfabrikken. Værsgo, Ole. Ja, tak. Øhm. Jeg synes... Øhm det er interessant øh, at, at være her i dag øh, og høre først Kaplans oplæg, som kredser om mange af de tanker, jeg selv har, øh, og som bekræfter tanker, jeg selv gør mig. Og så hører jeg så Martin Wienes øh, tale, og så må jeg også give ham ret i, at, at det har også sine nuancer. I et land som Danmark i hvert fald, øh, hvor vi betragter os selv som en, en, en stamme, med en, en fæ- at vi er i en samme båd på en eller anden måde, øh, der er der også tror jeg, en forestilling om, at den båd ikke skal støde på grund, øh, og at vi øh, fælles må være ansvarlige for, at det ikke sker. Men når jeg koncentrerer mig om den daglige danske politik, så ligner det mere noget, som Kaplan beskriver, end noget, som Martin beskriver. Når man taler om konkrete løsningsmodeller, konkrete problemer, som bliver taget op, så ligner det mere noget, som jeg har hørt Kaplan beskrive. Øhm. Min oplevelse af dansk politik er, at de politikere, som taler vælgerne efter munden, når vælgerne tager fejl, er mere populære end de politikere, som ærligt siger det, hvis vælgerne tager fejl. Som transportminister oplevede jeg, at den øh, nejhat, som jeg ofte havde på, når jeg, var, når jeg var ude i forskellige miljøer, der krævede et infrastrukturprojekt, at den var ikke lige så øh, vellykket i forhold til at skaffe mig stemmer, som den ja-hat, som andre transportminister har haft på. Og der skal man forstå, at det er jo ikke sådan, at når de kommer ud til et sted, hvor de kræver en motorvej til 10 milliarder, som aldrig vil blive bygget, at de så ligesom får den bygget. De siger sådan nogle ting som, det lyder meget rigtigt, det I siger. Jeg, jeg, jeg er villig til at i gang sætte en undersøgelse af det, I siger. Øhm, jeg vil prøve at løfte sagen øh, i Finansministeriet, det I siger. Øhm, og det hopper folk som regel på, selvom projektet ikke bliver til noget. Så kommer jeg ud, og jeg siger, <laughs> det som alle burde sige, dette infrastrukturprojekt giver ikke særlig meget mening sammenlignet med så mange andre infrastrukturprojekter. Selvfølgelig er det rart for jer at kunne køre 130 mellem øh, Holstebro og Ringkøbing, i stedet for blot 80 km i timen. 
Men der er ikke et trafikgrundlag for at have en øh, tosporet motorvej med 130 her. Altså det er, det, er, det er der ikke trafik nok til at retfærdiggøre den investering. Det antal mennesker, der sparer et antal minutter på den her strækning, er ikke stort nok til at retfærdiggøre de mange milliarder, som skal bruges. Det falder helt til jorden, og jeg er verdens mest afskyelige menneske, fordi de er vant til, at når der kommer en transportpolitiker ud, så siger vedkommende, at vedkommende tager det meget alvorligt, det der bliver sagt, og agter at gøre noget ved det. Øhm, min læsning af øh, den almindelige vælgers tilgang til politik er, at det for den almindelige vælger, Kaplan han taler om, at de er i deres følelses, følelsesvold, og det er rart for dem at give, give deres flø, følelser øh, øh, altså plads. Min opfattelse af politik er, at, at i den almen, hos den almindelige vælger, der handler det meget ofte om at bruge politik som et markedsføringsværktøj for sin person. Og det vil sige, at hvis det man si- siger, at man mener, er populært i den kreds, man kommer i, så får man selv noget social kapital ud af at sige det. Og det man siger, det er i højere grad afstemt efter, om man får social kapital ud af det omkring kantinebordet på arbejdspladsen, eller i familien, eller i idrætsforeningen, end om man egentlig tror på det. Så man har, altså, det er nogle men, altså de fleste mennesker er formentlig i dag i gruppestyret og ikke indre styret. De, de, deres moralbegreber, og det de siger, er styret af, hvad de, hvilken plads det giver dem i de grupper, de er i. Så, så hvis det er populært at sige i, i, på sin offentlige arbejdsplads, at øh, fandme også bare, øh, alle burde stemme på enhedslisten, fordi så ville vi få nogle flere penge, vi kunne bruge her på den her offentlige arbejdsplads til at hjælpe øh, de her mennesker, og få nogle flere kolleger, så vi kunne løse vores arbejde ordentligt. Så gør de det, fordi det er det, der gør, at de bliver populære på arbejdspladsen. Uh, hvis man forestiller sig på den arbejdsplads, der var en eller anden liberal, som siger, at altså, vi bruger i forvejen mange penge her, og, og de ekstra milliarder, som enhedslisten siger, at vi skal bruge, dem tror, tror jeg ikke, der er særlig stor nytteværdi af. Jeg tror mere, det bliver til noget byråkrati. Og, og i virkeligheden kunne vi måske skære lidt mere ned på møderne, og måske holder vi bare flere møder, hvis vi får flere medarbejdere osv. Det, det ville falde til jorden, og man ville tabe på det. Uh, og derfor tror jeg ikke, folk gør det. Hvad er så løsningen på det her... Uh, den, den der er ikke uh, lige for. Øhm, så, så sent som i dag er jeg, uh, Tom Steno i Berlinske, blev beskrevet som en krakilsk type. Fordi at når folk siger noget forkert, så insisterer jeg på at sige til dem, at det er forkert. Øh, det tror jeg, det, det er i hvert fald en medvirkende årsag til, at, at han siger, at jeg er en krakiler. Øh, så, så mi, altså jeg kan jo ikke... Altså der er en grund til, at da Anders Samuelsen ikke blev valgt, øh, og... og der skulle være en ny leder af Liberal Alliance. Der er en grund til, at jeg ikke greb ud efter den post. Jeg havde selverkendelsen nok til at vide, at den type, jeg er, ikke kan få bred opbakning i en befolkning. Og at Alex Vandopslag ville være meget bedre til det. Så, så jeg tror, løsningen er, at, øhm, at man skal have, at hvert parti skal have øh, forskellige typer. Øh, og der er nogen, der skal sælge produktet, og der er nogen, der skal lave produktet. Og øh, når jeg kigger ud over øh, nogle af de andre partier, så er det, synes jeg, at der i mange af partierne er en, en misforståelse af, hvad produktet er. Altså, der er for mange mennesker, der, er, der beskæftiger sig med at sælge partiet, i stedet for at skabe et produkt, der er, der er værdifuldt. Øh, jeg synes, øh, i, i nogle partier... Lad mig nævne enhedslisten, selvom jeg synes jo, det er et forfærdeligt parti. Men... Men der er, nogle, der er nogle, nogle forbenede ideologer i enhedslisten, som sørger for, at enhedslisten altid trækker i socialistisk retning. Og, og så er der en masse mennesker, der også beskæftiger sig med, hvordan man sælger det øh, bedst muligt. Øh, og på samme måde burde der også i alle blå partier være nogle folk, der, der sørger for, at produktet er, tr- altid trækker i en blå retning. Og så hjælper de nogle andre med at sælge produktet øh, f- til folk, fordi de andre er bedre. Ja. Så du ser faktisk enhedslisten som et mere ærligt parti? Skal du forstå sådan? Nej, jeg synes, at enhedslisten lyver konstant. Altså, ja, men altså, altså bare, bare tanken om, altså bare påstanden om, at socialisme kan gøre noget godt for et samfund, mener jeg er løgn. Altså, for jeg, tror ikke på, jeg kan ikke tro på, at de selv tror på det, når det kommer til stykket. Så derfor må det være løgn i en eller anden forstand. Øh, men men, men, men de, er dygtige, de er dygtige til at sørge for, at alt, hvad de foreslår, det trækker i socialistisk retning. 
og få nogle po- populære personer i front, der, der, der kan sælge so- socialismen, som om den har et menneskeligt ansigt. Okay, super. Tusind tak. Tusind tak. Kan jeg ikke få dig op også nu? Ja. Så øh, skal du lige have dit øh, headset på igen. Så hvis I begge to bliver deroppe, så tager vi lige øh, nogle, øh, nogle spørgsmål og refleksion. Øh, jeg vil lige nævne, at øh, øh, man kan få en rabatkode til bogen inde på eventet på øh, sebers.dk. Uh, hvis man vil købe den uh, en anden dag, eller er online, og det er der jo nogen, der er, der er også nogen, der følger med online. Uh, uh, det er via det link, alle har fået i deres reminder-e-mail. Okay, så er, så er det, uh, og selvfølgelig, nu er jeg i gang, bogen kan købe sig, uh, hvis man er til stede, og det er der jo immer væk, uh, 120 mennesker eller sådan noget, der er. Uh, og uh, den kan endda købes til en, en pris, der er en ren røverpris, 150 kroner. Hvad koster den normalt? Er der nogen, der ved det? Det var familie 240 eller sådan noget. 258 normalt, så i forhold til 150, jamen altså, køb den før din nabo. Øhm, godt. Øhm, vi, vi, går t- vi går til lidt uh, spørgsmål. Øh, der er et spørgsmål, du har allerede været, hvis der er en anden, så øh, det er der. Mm-hmm. Tak. Øhm, det er et spørgsmål til Martin. Øhm, Kaplan han påstår, at vælgere de er irrationelle, men er det ikke mere rigtigt bare at sige, at vælgere har forskellige politiske værdier? Altså, han får det jo til at lyde som om, at der er en facitliste på politiske spørgsmål. Jeg er ikke helt... Jeg er ikke sikker. Virker den her? Ja. Ja, godt. Øhm, jeg... Øh, jeg tror... Altså, det, det er lidt t- teknisk, øh, det der Kaplan ude i med at tale om... Han siger jo stadig, at vælgerne er rationelle, men på en irrationel måde. Øh, jeg ved ikke, om jeg synes, det er det, det, er det bedste bidrag i bogen i den lille skillen der, men... men øh, Ja, t- altså, han mener jo, at, at, øh, at det, der er irrationelt, det er, at de, de har nogle, øh, man kan sige ikke bare værdier, men nogle opfattelser, der er øh, forkert. Ikke? Så det er rent nok, det kan godt være, at vi kan have nogle værdier om, jamen, hvor meget lighed skal der være i et samfund, eller øh, hvad hedder det, øh, hvor mange, øh, hvad hedder det, øh, altså, hvad, hvad, hvad hedder det, hvor meget skal vi bruge på kultur, eller et eller andet. Men der er også nogle ting, som ikke er til, til debat, som for eksempel, hvad er effekten af, at vi sætter... Øh, hvad hedder det, topskat ned på den økonomiske vækst. Øh, og der siger han så, at hvis, man, hvis vælgerne er lidt kon- konkret, ligesom, jeg tager fejl af, jamen, så er det jo et, øh, så er det et problem og et tegn, tyd på, t- et tegn på, at de er et eller andet omfang er, er irrationelle, at de har de her fejlagtige opfattelser. Det som man måske så kan spørge om, det er at sige, jamen, øh, nogle af de her ting er, er der måske ikke et lige så klart svar på, som, øh, som, som så, så, så for eksempel, lad os det eksempel med topskatten og, og hvilken effekt det har på økonomisk vækst. Jo, det har jo nok en eller anden effekt, men præcis hvor stor den er, eller hvordan det ser ud, det ved vi jo reelt set ikke. Altså på den måde kan det godt være at sige, måske det er bare fordi, at, at, at vælgerne egentlig ikke er irrationelt, det er bare fordi, der er ikke så meget god information derude at respondere på. Jeg håber, det var et, et nogenlunde klart svar. Ole, vil du supplere? Hvad var spørgsmålet? Jeg kom til at falde hen i min Nej, <laughs> så kan det være lige meget. <laughs> så tager vi et spørgsmål til. Yes. Øhm, jeg vil egentlig øh, vende det hen lidt mod noget politikerlede. Øh, fordi en ting er jo, at øh, vælgerne kan være irrationelle og man kan have forskellige perspektiver, og man, noget er et problem for nogen, og noget er ikke, det, det samme er ikke et problem for andre. Altså, I Danmark, if it ain't broken, don't fix it, det er jo også en ting, vi sådan langsomt har udviklet vores samfund til. Men den her politikerled, altså vælger kan være irrationelle, fair nok. Politikere, som skal stemme maksimere, stemme optimere, særligt hen mod et valg, øh, kan det irrationelle være at tale politik, men det rationelle være at pege fingre, altså, som vi ser rigtig meget uden at vi behøver at sætte partier på, men som vi ser nu, synes jeg. Altså, når jeg ser folk, der taler om politikerlede, og det ser man meget ud på sociale medier, der er jo en, en, en gruppe i befolkningen, som er blevet meget synlig for os, som tidligere ikke var så synlig via de sociale medier. Og disse mennesker, de kan godt finde på at afslutte deres øh, kommentarer med bare at skrive politikerlede. Øhm, det er nogle mennesker, som mener, at, at Politikere snyder, bedrager og er uærlige. De samme mennesker er altid tilhængere af de mest snydende, bedragende og uærlige politikere, der findes. De er altid tilfalds for populister, som godt ved, at det, de siger, ikke passer, men som siger det, fordi det er populært. Ja, så jeg, jeg har meget svært ved at tage en, en del af, af vælgerne alvorligt, der kræver mere ærlighed for politikere, for det er vælgere, der stemmer på de mest uærlige politikere, der findes. Martin, har, har du noget? Hvad, hvad, hvad viser din forskning? Nej, ah, det, det ved jeg ikke. Jeg tror mere, man skal sige, at, øh, at politikerlede er en naturligt øh, konsekvens af, at der jo er 
Øh, vi er jo politikere, der konkur- parti- politikere og partier, der konkurrerer med hinanden. Og øh, hvad hedder det? Øh, det, det der, der skal de jo sige nogle pæne ting om deres egen politik, men det er jo også et nulsomspil. Så de, de bliver jo også nødt til at sige, hvis, de, hvis Ole mener, at, øh, at enhedslisten siger noget, der er forkert, så bliver han jo øh, nødt til at sige det. Selvfølgelig kan man godt bede politikerne om at sige det på en, på en ordentlig måde, men, men jeg tror også, det er en, det er en, det er en konsekvens af den øh, konkurrence, der er. Og det kan godt være, at den konkurrence er blevet lidt mere... Øh, intens, øh, nu er der også kommet sociale medier henover, men jeg tror i høj grad, det er det, det er en konsekvens af. Altså, der er meget af den, hvor, hvor politikere fortæller noget om andre politikers politik, som er et produkt af, at pressen øh, i stor stil sover. Altså, hvis vi havde en vågen presse, der pointerede det, når Mette Frederiksen for tiende gang siger noget, der ikke passer. Det, det har vi begyndt at få på det seneste, men vi har gennem, været igennem en helt valgperiode, hvor Mette Frederiksen har kunne sige hvad som helst, uden at det blev en historie i medierne. Og det er stadigvæk ikke en historie i medierne, at det ikke kun handler om træer, men at der er en skov, at, at, at der er en systematik omkring den måde, Mette Frederiksen kommunikerer på, som udgør en skov af løgne i et omfang, som vi ikke har set tidligere. Det er ikke endnu en pressehistorie. Derfor er der politikere, der bliver nødt til at påpege, modstanderpolitikere, som bliver nødt til at påpege, der bliver simpelthen løjet. Det er der nogen, der ikke kan lide at høre, at øh, man taler dårligt om andre menneskers politik. De siger, at du burde tale noget øh, mere bare om, hvad du selv vil, i stedet for at disse dine politiske modstandere. Men, men det er igen, det, det er, det er nogle, altså, de har ikke forstået, at, at der, er en, altså, der er noget på spil her. Hvad er det, der foregår? Og nogen skal jo fortælle det, og hvis pressen ikke gør det, så er der andre, der må gøre det. Er politikerledet ikke også en, en konsekvens af, den politiske konkurrence om, om vælgerne indebærer, at man må v- love ting, man ikke kan holde. Altså, love ting, der måske er umulige at holde. Lover man vil løse problemer, som ikke kan løses politisk? Øh, det det, det gør, gør politikere jo i et eller andet omfang. Jeg, jeg, igen vil jeg øh, måske være, være den, der trækker i retning af at, at, at tegne et mere rosende billede af vores demokrati. De fleste af de ting, som, som politikere lover, det gør de, fordi de regner med, at de kan gennemføre det. Der, der er løbende sådan nogle, hvad hedder det, optællinger af, hvor mange løfter, som politikere er dem, de, de giver at gennemføre. Og, og de fleste af dem bliver faktisk øh, gennemført. Altså så, øh, når en, når en, når ja, en ja, de, de er mere konkrete. Men ja, ja. sådan noget som, øh, 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 vi skal gøre noget ved børns mistrivsel. Det skal vi jo også. <laughs> men, det jo, men, men det er jo så svært at sige, hvad, hvad, er, men, godt, hvad er godt nok? I, men inden man ved, hvad problemet er, så er det lidt svært at gøre noget, ikke? Ja, ja, men det, det, ja. det er jo det, jeg Altså, hvis vi tager... Ja, undskyld, at I har et horn i siden på Socialdemokrater. Undskyld. Det overrasker men, os, Ole. Det er ja. det eneste. Men, men prøv at høre. De sidste... De, altså, Mette Frederiksens valgperiode kender vi alle. Vi, vi ved, i hvilket omfang der blev talt sandt og ikke blev talt sandt. Helle Thorning kom til magten på et program, der hed Færre Løsning, som var underfinansieret med mellem 22 og 39 milliarder kroner. Derfor fik vi i ugerne og månederne efter øh, diskussionen om en løftebrudsregering, fordi der var mellem 22 og 39 milliarder kroner, som ikke kunne gennemføres fra deres færre løsningplan. Nyop har vi også været inde på. Nyop han går til valg og vinder et valg på at have lovet uændret efterløn til alle. Øh, der går få måneder, så laver øh, Måns Lykketoft en finanslov som finansminister, hvor efterlønnen bliver ændret. Altså, det, det, det er de sidste tre socialdemokratiske regeringer, vi har med at gøre her. De sidste tre socialdemokratiske valgsejre. Nyop kommer til sejr på en løgn. Helle Thorning kommer til sejr på en løgnagtig færre løsningsplan. Mette Frederiksen løg ikke særlig meget i valgkampen, men hun har gjort det i perioden her for at vinde det næste valg. Vi tager et spørgsmål. Ja, jeg hedder Michael Sandford. Øh, og øh, jeg vil sige om, om Brian at øh, han har jo ret i det generelle, hvor Martin kommer med tre eksempler, som er undtagelser. Og på den måde, så mener jeg egentlig, at Brians og Martins indlæg, de går meget fint i spænd. Og så mit spørgsmål, det går på, jamen, øh, hvorfor øh, taler man ikke mere om de meget røde medier? 80 procent af alle journalister, også i Danmark, er, er venstreorienteret. Og det er måske derfor, vælgerne øh, også er uoplyste. Uh, altså, uh, hvis nu vi uh, hvad det, holdt et uh, event i morgen uh, på, hos Arbejderbevægelsens Erhvervsråd, så er jeg sikker på, at der var en, der ville række hånden op og sige, at næsten alle medier i Danmark de er jo ejet af hvad hedder det, kapitalistiske virksomheder, som kun har øje for profit og som bare vil have skatten ned. Uh, så jeg tror, at den der kritik er noget, der kommer, er noget, der kommer fra, fra, uh, fra begge sider. Jeg tror, det er svært at sige 
de, de analyser, der er lavet, der sådan systematisk prøver at sige, jamen, bliver der talt til fordel for, for, for rød blok eller blå blok, for eksempel på DR eller på TV2, eller i, øh, hvad, hvad hedder det, og i andre, altså de her officielle medier, de finder i hvert fald ikke den her form for ubalance. Så jeg tror ikke, at svaret skal finde, i hvert fald ikke findes udelukkende i medierne. Officielt så er tiden ved at være gået, men jeg tillader mig altså lige at lade os gå et par spørgsmål over tid, og det betyder så, at hvis man har beregnet, at man skal gå nu, så er det ikke uhøfligt at gøre det, men vi kører til videre. Men Martin, jeg har et problem. Jeg burde sidde i, i Københavns øh, borgerrepræsentation lige nu. Nå, okay. <laughs> jamen, øh, øh, jamen, ved, så, så giver du næsten sig selv, så bliver vi nødt til at stoppe ja, det nu. Ja, ja. Tak. Tusind tak men til Martin. Martin kan jo fortsætte. <laughs> Nej, det, 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 det synes jeg ikke. Ja, Tusind tak, tak til Martin Vines og Ole Birke Olsen. Og tak fordi I kom.